1 is where we're going to be, James chapter 1, and we started last week with the first 11 verses. We will pick up verse 12. I want to say something that's somewhat controversial, but it really is a cold, hearth truth in the world that we live in today. And you know it's true, we know it's true, and we always blame somebody else for it. But we live in a society where everybody plays the victim card. Everybody plays the victim card. And the reason everybody plays the victim card is that our society celebrates the people who win the blame game. That, that's what our society does. What happened? It's not my fault. It's not my responsibility. It's their fault. They did it. It's in my genes. It's hereditary. It's hardwired into our family. I'm that family, right? It's the bad circumstances of my life. It's too difficult. It's the social construct of our day. And listen, if we can't blame somebody else for it, we'll blame God for it. It's God's fault. God made me that way. God orchestrated the events to where I had to make that decision. God allowed this to happen. Now, we should not be surprised at victimology, the study of being a victim. That's what we're professionals at. We should not be surprised because we are professionals at the blame game. In fact, we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. We go and we read how God made man and woman in his image. And then in Genesis 3, Adam started playing the blame game. Y'all know what happened. He played the game. He said, uh, God, it's not my fault. She made me do it. It's her fault. She made me eat it. Well, where's the fruit, Adam? Well, it's, it's in my stomach. It's in your stomach. I had to get in your stomach. Well, she pretty much forced me to eat it. And because you made her, it really is your fault, God. It's the blame game. We all know about it. And so we learn it from birth, and yet many of us, we never move past it. And consequently, it destroys our life. It, it creates discontentment in our friendships. It creates dysfunctional families, and we're dissatisfied with life. And most of all, we are disconnected with God as a result of it. So I want to talk to you this morning in a message entitled, Don't Take the Bait. Don't take the bait. So look at your neighbor and say, don't take the bait. Don't take the bait. You know exactly what they're talking about, don't you? Yeah, yeah, you know what they're talking about. We kicked off a collection of messages last week called Activate. And for the record, James is one of my very favorite books of the Bible because it, it's such a practical book. It creates a, a prototype of how we should live as believers in Jesus. It almost didn't make it into the canon of Scripture with the Protestant Reformers, but I'm so glad it did because it, it's so relevant to today. And last week we said uh, how we view our trials, how we view our temptations determines everything about us as it relates to our faith. How do we respond to those? In fact, our faith informs us on how to handle those problems. And last week we said temptation is from the devil that causes us to stumble and trials are from God that causes us to stand. And so we talked about the trials that came from God that cause us to stand. Now some of those become our misery, but they can also form our maturity. That's what we said last week. This morning, James is going to take us into a deep dive into temptation. All right, this is what temptation is. And what he's going to do, he's going to give us three stages of temptation. So if you're taking notes, th these are the stages that are so important from uh, verses 12 through 15. Three stages of temptation. Now, <clears throat> there's only one type of person that gets an excuse for today's message. 
and that's the perfect person, all right? So if you're perfect, this message does not relate to you. You can get on your phone, and you can look at Facebook, and you can be perfect and blame everybody else for problems, all right? So this does not relate to you, but if you're not perfect, Number one, here we go. The first stage of temptation is this. Distraction is a natural courtship. We got to own that. We got to just embrace that. Distraction is a natural courtship. I want you to go ahead. 12 is a recap of last week, but look at verse 13. It says this. Let no one say when he is tempted. Now, notice here, it doesn't, it doesn't say if he is tempted, does it? It says when he is tempted. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by who? God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. That's so important. Why is this important? Temptation to disobey God or sin never comes from God because God is whole. God is holy. God is the opposite of sin. So don't blame God. You can't blame God. So Adam, quit blaming Eve because you're ultimately blaming God for the decision that you are culpable of. It's time to stop playing the blame game. God does not tempt. But listen, we know this. God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. He allows us to be tempted because overcoming temptation proves our loyalty with God. That's what it does. When we overcome that temptation, we prove our loyalty. This is so important because God, whether you realize it or not, God has prepared a way out of temptation. You can't blame your way out of it. You can't shirk your way out of it. God makes a way. So, just because you are tempted to cheat on your taxes, you don't have to. The temptation is not a sin. You don't have to. Just because you students are tempted to cheat on your test, you don't have to. We're distracted. There's sin in our nature, but we don't have to obey that temptation, all right? Just because you are tempted to cheat on your spouse, you don't have to. You don't have to. Is what, is what he's saying here. So a lot of people don't realize, but Jesus was tempted, all right? Jesus was tempted. And it's important to know how Jesus was tempted in order to know how temptation can be overcome, what happened when Jesus was tempted? Well, he was baptized by John the Baptist. He was tempted by the devil. And he refused temptation after each temptation, after each one of them. What was he doing? What was he doing during those 40 days and 40 nights? He was fasting and he was praying. Now, it doesn't take a genius to, to, to know what's going on in your heart when, you're, when you sin. But I guarantee you, you're not fasting, and you're not praying. So how do we respond to temptation, church? Do you fast, or do you pray, or do you succumb to it? Is that, Jesus was praying, and he was fasting. He was the Son of God. So what does that mean? Praying and fasting is the prescription for temptation. That's what we're supposed to do. I'll say it this way. The last time you disobeyed God... Were you praying about it? Did you fast about it? This is what Jesus did. So why, why do they fall into temptation? What, what happens when we fall into temptation? Look at verse 14. It says this, But each person is tempted when he is lured. I love that word picture. He is lured and enticed by his own Desire, that is his fallen nature. So James here, he wants us to be proactive in our faith and have a game plan against temptation. Why? Because, listen, you know this, the devil has a game plan against you. He, he's got a playbook, and he knows 
your weakest link. He knows where you allow your guard to be lowered. And he sneaks in for temptation. And what happens? We lose every time. So if we don't have a game plan against the enemy, we're going to lose every time. He's got a game plan against us. And so this distracts us. And, you know, we see this all the time, don't we? And this is why it's so important for this message to be personal. Don't think of somebody else. But, but let, let's just do that just for a minute. H- have you ever seen somebody else make a bad decision? And you're like, what were they thinking? <laughs> like they were a freight train of bad decisions. And the bridge said, I'm out. There are signs everywhere. The bridge is out, and the freight train is rolling, and and the conductor is like living in his own universe, not looking at the signs that say bridge out ahead. We see that in other people, don't we? But guess what? We don't see that in ourselves. Those are blind spots that the enemy knows how to play with those temptations those are blind spots and that's that's the word picture and 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 so we're called as believers as the church i'll just be honest that we're called to make sure that nobody's train tries to go over the bridge that's out we don't want people's lives to be distracted destructed and destroyed and so where is the area where you are distracted Where's that area? We got to know that. That's the game plan. That's the area of greatest temptation. And if we don't have a plan to overcome our distractions, our distractions will overcome us. And I want want us to look here in verse 14, the word picture. This is is extraordinarily relevant for me. Um, Verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. What attracts you? What entices you? What compels you away from God? What demands your attention and your mind? The affection of your heart. Because let me tell you something. The word picture is this. Okay, you ready? The devil is the ultimate angler. He is the ultimate fisherman. And he knows how to catch fish that's the greek word picture for this text it's a fisherman who is baiting a hook now what's the role of a fisherman who's baiting a hook you want to bait it in such a way that is the most attractive the most compelling that the fish don't see it but it's there and it's the hook it's the hook when it bites. Now, I grew up in Yancey's subdivision, and my favorite bait of choice is the hula popper. I love it. And I'm kind of sadistic in that way because I like to throw it near the, uh, to the side of the, of the pond and just kind of like pretend like I'm baiting this fish. It's floating on top of the water. I'm going to pop it just right, and then that big largemouth bass is going to hit it, and he's going to come out of the water. And that treble hook, oh, it will set good. It will set good. And think about the bait. I mean, it's so colorful. It's got all these feathers, and it's so attractive. It's exactly what the fish is looking for. But little does he know, little does he see the hook that is under the tail feather. It's there. It's going to entrap him. It's going to entice him so the point here is that the devil is the ultimate angler he knows how to play to your desires he knows how to play to our enticements in such a way for us to bite the hook that's that's his role we're living in a lake of lures to the left and to the right we have flawed appetites we have fatal attractions why Because of Genesis 3. Thank you, Adam, very much. Distraction is a natural courtship. That's number one. Number two, desire is an optional consent. 
Desire is an optional consent. Look at verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. Now, this is kind of a strange word picture, okay? Because, you know, we, we just went from fishing. Now we're talking about birthing. I'm not really sure what's going on, but I guess James just got through talking to the men's ministry. Now he's walking down the hall. He's going to talk to the women ministry for a minute. All right, so here we go. Women's ministry. Desire conceives in a person to deliver and bring life into sin. That's what he's saying. That desire is conceived in us and we bring birth to sin. It's the desire that gives birth to to the sin after conception. Put differently, sin is not something that you do. Sin is giving life to destruction and ultimately death. So you can't hide it. You can't pretend it's not there. It just comes together. We birth sin. It's a strange word picture. I get it. But James is saying you are pregnant with sinful desires that will grow up and deliver destruction and death so the child's name that is delivered is sin and when that child grows up the grandchild delivers death all right and so today's verses are seen in a direct contrast to last week all right because the results are the opposite look at look at the graph last week we talked about our test our test is from God, that leads to endurance, which leads to life. But our, our desires, our temptations, come from the devil, which leads to sin and ultimately death. And it's how we respond. Trials lead to life, temptations lead to death. And so here's the deal. The only way, this is so important, the only way our lives are sabotaged by the devil, by those temptations, is if we give him consent. If we give him consent. And consent starts with us. It starts with us. James is saying, listen, you cannot play the blame game. You can't do it. We can't blame our circumstances. We can't blame others. We can't blame the devil. Because the sinner says, I consent with biting the bait. And I got hooked. And it doesn't take, uh, you know, etymological genius to know the word hook led to the word hooker in English. Right? Right? I mean, the, there's just something spiritual about language development. There's an enticement there. there there's, this, there's this attraction there. There's this affection there. A sinner consents to the bait and gets hooked every single time. And listen, church, where we are today is a cumulative result of how we handle temptation. It is how we handle temptation temptation here's the formula distraction plus desire equals death distraction plus desire equals death and that leads us to point three death is a consequential consummation death is a consequential consummation look at the latter part of verse 15 15b and when sin is fully grown brings forth death listen to that phrase when when what when sin is fully grown same conception word picture it brings forth death so listen when 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 sin is young it looks good it's enticing it seems pleasant it feels right there's euphoria there's hedonistic experiences there are immediate forms of happiness but it leads to regret and fading fleeting sadness all right so when it grows up sin grows up just when you thought you could escape it the hook sets in it captures and it consummates death and so the conception of sin leads to the consummation of sin sin thrills 
then it kills. All right? Sin fascinates, then it assassinates every single time. You think you can hide it, but it cannot hide you, and it will always find you. So how do you handle your distraction? Distraction today becomes desire tomorrow and death forever. Death forever. Be sober-minded. Knowing where you stand on this continuum. Where am I? Has the hook set in? How do I handle that temptation? James says you got to get a hold of it or it's going to get a hold of you. In fact, he says this in verse 16. Do not be deceived. Don't be deceived, my, bella, uh, my beloved brothers. Quit fooling yourself because you're the only person you're fooling. Well, Chad, uh, you know, nobody's perfect. <laughs> I get that, but listen. Sin, this is what sin will do. Sin will take you farther than you want to go every single time. It'll take you farther. Not only will it take you farther than you want to go, it will keep you longer than you want to stay. Because some of you know that you're there right now and, and, and you're tired of staying there. It'll take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And you're paying that debt right now. Look at verse, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So, you're either birthing the word of truth or birthing the word of death. You're either birthing the first fruits of the Lord or the first fruits of the devil. Either or, not and, both. And, you know, it's true. it comes full circle to the blame game. The blame game. Now, this weekend, I was at, uh, we had our homecoming kind of reunion for the class of 2000. And we were sharing all the stories in high school that, quite frankly, I had forgotten. And one particular story was after a Friday football game, we were riding around the square. And how many know nothing good comes? That's another preacher. Okay. Uh, we were riding around, and somebody mentioned, Chad, do you remember that time that you ran into the back of my car riding around the square? I said, that's interesting because the way that I see it, I remember the time that your 1992 Honda stopped in front of me while we were riding around the square. And so every story that we told, we just had fun with it, but it was the blame game. It was the blame game. Our memory, that's what protects us. That's what hedges and cultivates the sin in our heart is that we shirk the responsibility. And so the, the, the question is this. This is kind of where we landed, and it was just kind of funny. But regardless of who, whose fault it was, who experienced the damage? And the reality is that we both experienced the damage. Now, I don't know your situation. I don't. And I'm not preaching anybody's situation. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Some of you are still experiencing the damage because you won't take ownership of the responsibility. I don't know if it's your marriage. I don't know if it's your family. I don't know if it's your friends. I don't know if it's your job. But <laughs> there's something about the freedom that we experience when we take responsibility for our sin. We repent of that sin and we walk in freedom. And Scripture is real clear. We can overcome through the power of the blood of Jesus. But we first have to own up to it. We've got to own up to it to overcome the desire that will lead to death. And you know it's true and I know it's true. We all lose at the blame game, don't we? The person who blames the most loses the most. 
Everyone is a loser. And that's why James is pleading to his audience, don't take the bait. Can you pray with me? With heads bowed and with eyes closed this morning, I, I wonder what your situation is. What's the situation in your life where you are experiencing uh, the bondage of biting the bait? That the, the enemy has tempted you and you have fallen time and time again. Can I, can I tell you something? The Lord wants to release you